Welcome, everyone, to the SI Media Podcast. I am your host, Jimmy Trena. Thanks so much for listening. Very, very, very busy and good episode this week. It's obviously one year since Corona shut everything down. It all started Wednesday, March 11th, 2020. Utah Jazz's Rudy Gobert test positive. NBA ends up suspending the season. Ryan Rucco, play-by-play man for ESPN, was calling a game Mavericks Nuggets when the announcement came down and there's a great video of uh, Mark Cuban reacting to the news. So Ryan is on the pod to talk about that night and um, working in the era of COVID as a play-by-play guy. And then Brian Stelter, who covers media for CNN, uh, comes on to talk about how media has handled COVID, reported it, and uh, where we're at with everything. He covers media, so there's a lot of uh, media talk with Brian Stelter of CNN. Before we get to those, just very quickly, if you missed last week, Mike Florio from Pro Football Talk was on the podcast two weeks ago. Brian Curtis from The Ringer, Alan Seppenwall, TV critic from Rolling Stone on the pod. Three weeks ago, Darren Rovell on the uh, trading card explosion. All good episodes. If you missed any of them, check them out in the archives. And please subscribe to the Sports Illustrated Media Podcast. All right. First up, Brian Rucco from ESPN and the Yes Network in New York. And then Brian Stalter of CNN right here on the SI Media Podcast. All right, joining me now, man with a, a lot of jobs, ESPN, NBA and WNBA, Yes Network, Little Nets, Little Yankees, has a very popular podcast with CC Sabathia. He is play-by-play man, Ryan Rucco. Ryan, how's it going? Good to be with you, man. It's been a while. You know you're one of my favorites, so I'm happy to be with you. I appreciate that. And as I've always said, it you know it's always fun when, you, when you're when you calling the Yankee games on yes as a Yankee fan. I, I love the way you do the game, so I'm a fan as well. Thank you. On the Yes Network. And um, had to have you on since, you know, it's the one year. And I, everyone's using the word anniversary, which is a little messed up to me. But anniversary of basically our world getting shut down with COVID. And you were calling a uh, Nuggets Mavericks game the night as, as the NBA canceled, well, not canceled, postponed, I guess, and shut down the season. So I figured you'd be a great person to talk to about that. Um, before I get into like specific questions, what's, what's sort of uh, your mindset this week with the fact that it's been a year? Does it feel like it's been a year? Does it feel like it's been a couple of days? What's your feeling you know, on it all? It's, it's interesting because I've heard some of my friends and family use the phrase I'm about to, and I've used it myself. Like in some ways, time has moved ridiculously slowly. And in other ways, it's like, what? Like it's gone by in a blink, you know? Um, And it is, it's hard to believe that it's, it's hard to believe that it's been a year already, but it's, but at the same time, it, 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 it now to me, it does feel like it's been that long. And I think part of the reason why I've started to appreciate it feeling like it's been a while is how adjusted I have felt. And so many others have felt to what's become our new normal, you know? And I think that as novelty with that has worn off, which is sad in a lot of ways. Um, I think that it's kind of set in how long it's been because it's like, Oh my gosh, like I am so, so comfortable putting on a mask, you know, everywhere I go, like I don't even think somebody went to shake my hand the other day. I think it was the first time I've shaken a hand in a year, you know, like it it was, and I was just like, I don't even think about a handshake anymore, you know? And I think so in that sense, it takes a while for those things to sink in. So that's where it kind of, it does feel like a while. Yeah. So I was trying to get a, a grip on the timeline of it all. So it was Wednesday, March 11th, mm-hmm. when Rudy Gobert got the positive COVID test. You, you were calling, though, Maverick, Mavericks Nuggets. So this all happened the same night. Mm-hmm. Just take me through your night and the timeline of it and what was going through. Um you know, you called the game with with Doris Burke and Tom Rinaldi. Mm-hmm. And um, how did it go from the Rudy Gobert positive test to the season getting canceled to you guys announcing it? I mean, the video 
it's a legendary video now of Mark Cuban finding it out on his phone, which was on during your game on ESPN. Yeah. Um, and a shout out to our director, Jeff Evers, for getting that shot. Um, and our producer, Ian Gruca, who was amazing that night. Um, first of all, just as like sort of the backdrop, it's funny because now we all have obviously, um, you know, become incredibly familiar with COVID and the specter of it. Um, and, and obviously some people have, uh, have paid the ultimate price. Other people have lost loved ones. And at the very least, everybody has had their world uh, totally and completely, um, you know, reformed. Uh, but at that time traveling, like I, Doris and I were talking about, like you could feel it was starting to get eerie in the airports. And like, I remember even, and I was following it very closely because I was supposed to be getting married in Italy and uh, I had seen what was happening there. And, and, and I was like, this is, things are going to change here soon. Like we're going to catch on, you know, you're amazing. For- it's amazing. Yeah. You just said that because until you just said that I had forgotten that it was really in Italy. Yeah. Really badly before it got here and got crazy here totally forgot about that yeah yeah right now. exactly because now we're all so adjusted but like you remember it was seeing like what was happening in italy and one of my one of my closest friends uh girlfriends uh, is from there and her parents are doctors there and they were like you cannot believe how horrible th- yeah. it, this is and um and i'm a Serie A fan so i was watching that be sh- you know shut down i'm like hold on a second so anyway um going into that game actually doris Tom and I had talked about it at our production lunch, like not thinking the season would be shut down, but thinking like, oh, this might be our last game with fans, you know? So uh, there was already this eerie feeling. We were already thinking it might be the last game with fans. When we met with Rick Carlisle uh, and uh, Mike Malone, they were both six feet apart from us in the room as we did our meetings. We didn't do handshakes uh, for the first time. I remember I didn't get makeup from the makeup artist because I didn't want to use the same brush he was using on someone else's face. Like there were already things that, you know, you were conscious of. Um, But just before the game was going to start, I think it was, or maybe it was in the first quarter, Doris had seen on her phone. She was like, Hey, do you see what's going on in Oklahoma city? I was like, no, you know, and she was like, well, they're holding up the game. They're not sure why. Gobert was listed as questionable with an illness. So people are wondering, is that, does that have to do with it? You know, like, all right, we got to monitor. So I alert the truck and Doris alerts the truck. And we say, Hey, the truck being for those who don't know, you know, our production staff on site, we're like, Hey, make sure we have tabs on this with Gobert because that's something obviously that's very newsy. It's also something that we don't ever want to say over the air until we're, we have a hundred percent confirmed, you know? And so uh, we end up um, a little bit later on in the game. Doris uh, ends up saying like, oh, my gosh, she looks at her phone. She's like, uh, Rudy Gobert. Uh, or she was like, the game is um, or maybe we actually didn't know yet. But but there was like more speculation about that. And um, I was like to our producer, I was like, hey, it sounds like it might be this. Like, let's make sure whatever. So maybe it's the second quarter or third quarter. Just before we're about to go to break, our producer Ian Gruca gets in my ear and he goes, hey, uh, tease that we have major breaking news uh, coming up uh, on the other side. Literally, he, he's telling that as it's like eight, seven. He just got word. So we go to break and I'm thinking that the news is going to be that Rudy Gobert tested positive for coronavirus. They canceled that game. And as we're in break, he tells me, uh, OK, Scott Van Pelt's going to take it out. He's going to be joined by Woj and Woj is going to break the news that the NBA season is being suspended. And we're like, and I'm like, what? Because even though I was very, and I gave that background just to say, I was very aware and even being very aware and very conscious of what was going on. I never, I thought that might be the last night with fans. You know, I thought it might even be the last night we traveled the games for a while. I never thought it would be the last night the NBA played. And it what, was, at what point the game you yeah. called Nuggets Mavericks? Where was right. that at second quarter, third quarter? I think you said second. Yeah, like, it was second or third quarter. I don't remember. I gotta right. I gotta look back at it, but yeah. it was in the second or third quarter of the game. And um and then we're trying to figure out we're like, so now all of a sudden it becomes a news broadcast, right? With right. just a game going on and the game becomes the the you know sub story. But then we also are trying to find out like, okay, are the other games playing? Like, are they maybe gonna cancel the rest of this game? Like well, you know, what are they doing? And um, and so it was just a scramble to get that information. And Tom Rinaldi did a great interview with Mark Cuban 
after that famous shot of him like looking at his phone and seeing the news. And Mark was actually the one who was able to let us know. He came to the broadcast table to talk to me and Doris. We were trying to get a hold of the PR staff, but they were dealing with a million things. And we said, hey, Tom would like to talk to you. And Mark, to his credit, was like, absolutely knew it was important for, you know, an owner to to use the platform in that moment. And he was the one who actually let us know that the players were aware of, of, of it being the final game as they were playing, uh, which helped shape the way we were able to, to broadcast it down the stretch too. But it was, so just, they finished, they finished the, the Nuggets Mavericks game that yeah. night. And yeah, I think there was another game that started at 10 30, if I'm not mistaken. There was supposed Coast. to be another game, a Sacramento game on ESPN, and it got canceled. It, it got was, canceled. Uh, okay. I think it was New Orleans, Sacramento. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it got canceled. And Dave Pash and Richard Jefferson were there right. for that game. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, and, and, I mean, there's, there's a million things about that night that stand out. I'll, I'll let you steer how you want to steer it. But one of the great ironies of that night, Jimmy, is that Doris had COVID as we were broadcasting that game, you know, um, she, she didn't know it at the time, obviously. I had no and then, idea. And then you and Tom, did you, I, I don't want you to speak for Tom. Did you, did you ever get COVID? It, no. I mean, to my knowledge, no. Uh, I had been super sick at the end of January. So I always thought maybe that was, that you know that was covid um but i never had that confirmed and uh and i had tested positive for the flu so it probably was just the flu mm-hmm. but you know we monitored our symptoms i had been traveling with the nets the day before and then i had been you know with doris for the broadcast not to mention i was just doing a ton of traveling at that time for for games but uh the nets had had four positives and i had been part of their traveling party mm-hmm. and then you know obviously i worked right next to doris um and uh, and we all had to, had to quarantine as a result. And ESPN was like checking up on us every day to see how we were. Um, but none of us, to my knowledge, who were part of that broadcast crew that night, had symptoms at least in that two weeks following that night. Amazing. And then, so you were nice enough to talk to me the next morning on Thursday morning about what that experience was like. We didn't do it on a pod. We just we spoke on the phone, and I. I put your quotes in my in my train of thoughts column and I look back on it today and I, I thought it was interesting because I asked you mm. if, at that time, if on March 12, 2020, if you were nervous about being in the building with that many people when you were calling the game and you said no. Mm. Um, looking back, do you think, wow, that was pretty wild that I wasn't nervous? I mean, yeah. and meanwhile, you're sitting next to Doris and she yeah. had COVID. So yeah. it's, it's it- an interesting one to look back on. That is, man. I would love to, um, you know what? It's funny, Jimmy. I can remember, I think I was talking to you from the plane. I was about to fly back sitting on the plane. Um, I would love to, you have to send me, uh, I mean, I'm sure I can Google it, but I'd love to look back and just see, because, you know, it's interesting. I have this journal over here um, and I wrote down thoughts like throughout the beginning of the pandemic, knowing it was a historic time. And, you know, especially as you become adjusted in a lot of ways, it can dull the, fear you felt at that moment or the emotions you felt because now you've become more familiar with the situation. And I am glad like I, there is some documentation to remind me of what it was like in that moment when I didn't have the education about it that I do now, you know? Nice. Um, and, but so it's funny to me because on the flip of that, I would be way more fearful of that situation today right. than I was then. Right. Even though in general, I think, I was more fearful of the virus then than I am now, obviously with the tools we have and just being a come, becoming adjusted to how to yeah. kind of try and navigate and whatever with still having a great respect for the virus. But at that time it was like where it felt like a totally hidden enemy that you didn't know. And you, you kind of at that time thought if I get it, I'm going to die. You know, like that was, that was kind of the mentality. I don't know why, you know, Jimmy, I probably at that time just didn't feel scared about it yet in that regard mm-hmm. um because i was thinking that it wasn't really widespread here yet you know right. like i right. was thinking probably like yeah it's not it's it's just you know it's it's not really it's not really around here had i known like that it was spreading since late january maybe earlier i, I probably <laughs> would have answered yeah. that differently and i think a lot of people at that time I think a lot of people at that time had a mindset like, oh, you know, everything will be shut down for two weeks, maybe three weeks. And, you know, who knew a year later, you know, we'd still be in this mess, although it does seem to be some light at the end end of the tunnel. Um, Yeah. 
it, it, you know, and I thought, I thought the NBA handled things as well as they could have. I think they got ahead of it, suspending the season when they did. The bubble, I think, was a huge success. And listen, every sport had to navigate it, and every sport has their own issues. Um, I've said this on the pod. I think the NFL got a huge break compared to the other sports because they only play once a week, whereas the NBA and the NHL and MLB are every night. You know, MLB, they were helped by the fact that their games are outside. There's, so every sport is their own. I thought, though, when I look back on it, um, one place I will not give a pass, though, was the next day was on that Thursday after the NBA shutdown, the Big East playing the first half of their tournament. Oh, yeah. And then and then make everyone go home at halftime. Like, talk about just not having a clue. And I think every other conference had canceled their conference tournament except the Big East. And, you know, that that was I that's one of the things I remember. Yeah. Uh, about those first couple of well, days. It, it, it's also, it, it, it's also, um, you know, it, 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 at that time, there was just such a lack of education, you know, mm-hmm. like it was right. It was just like, you didn't really know. You didn't mem- right. remember too. remember that we were all sold a, a bill of goods about it, not being transmitted from person to person when, right. when it first came out, you know, and, well, yeah. and and we and we were told don't wear a mask at first, you know, like hey, you know, only if you have symptoms does it matter, you know. And, and so, um, so I feel like everybody, because there wasn't and there really hasn't ever been, you know, uh, well formed communication throughout this process, um, which is obviously just a struggle in general in today's media landscape. But I, I like because of that, I think I think some like these conferences and, and stuff. They were kind of left to their own devices. And that's what's so weird about Jimmy is like, I'm grateful to the NBA that they made that move that night, because I think more than anything else, if you look at the biggest domino that woke up our country to how serious it was, I think it was that. I think it was the NBA doing that. It was like, oh, oh, oh my. Well, it was a one two punch on that Wednesday because Gobert tested positive and then the NBA suspended the season. And then you had shortly thereafter Tom Hanks testing positive. And I think when you have obviously someone of that magnitude in this country, I think that made a lot of people say, holy shit, we're in something deep right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. When you see familiar names, you know, and I can remember then too, cause I've been reading a bunch on it because of the Italy stuff. And mm. I remember then like about five or six days later, like up on the scroll as I was quarantined, seeing like names pop up. And somebody saying like, oh, my gosh, you know, I think it was when the Nets like announced they had four positive tests. And like, oh, man, Nets have four positive tests. And like KD, I think, came out and was one of them, whatever. And I was like, you don't understand. It's not like you're going to it's going to be more names than not, you know, like the way this is. It's not like it, it. And Tom Hanks, I think, was one of those names that helped to spark the framing of it mentally where it's like, oh, like. This is going to it's not going to be a weird thing anymore to be like, oh, yeah, you know, Bob has COVID or, or Chrissy has COVID. It's going to be like, yeah, like, you know, a, a huge, huge, huge amount of people are going to end up having this. Yeah. So now let's fast forward one year later to now as someone in the building calling the games. What's your sort of comfort level with people in the stands? Like, I, I guess here in in I know with the Knicks and Nets here when you do the Nets games. I guess if there's only like two or 3,000 people in the building, if they put, you know, 15,000 in Barclays, would you be comfortable calling the game there? What's, you know, I mean, we focus so much on the athletes, but there's so many other people, not just you because you're on TV as the play-by-play man, but you have camera people, you mm-hmm. have, you know, a lot of tech people. Um, so, you know, it's it's still a dicey thing. I don't know. how do you, What do you feel about like the arenas being filled right now? You know, I, I think that um, I think that there needs to be some sort of phasing, you know, into it, which is what's happening, um, you know, in, 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 in all cases and in some cases, larger swaths than than others. Like at Barclays, we've just had 300 fans thus far. It was welcome. Oh, 300. I thought it was three. OK, it, it's I about can... to go up. It's about okay. to go up. They're going to they can have up to 10, 10 percent. Excuse me. Uh, so that would be somewhere around 1700 at Barclays. The garden. Okay. Has That's what I thought around, they were doing now. Okay. The garden has already had around 2000. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. Barclays has had like 300. So I've been in the building with like 300 um, and I enjoyed it. The setup is still so safe. Um, 
I feel like I, I feel like there might be a moment where it's like, whoa, you know, if if when I the next Nets game I do where there's you know seventeen hundred people or whatever it is, but I have to say the the amount of attention that's been paid to the uh, health and safety precautions and that um, I, I don't think it's going to bother me. I really don't. Uh, we are really they've done a great job of uh, we have plexiglass all around us. We're in our own separate area calling the game, you know, um, and the way we know this virus transmits now too. Mm. I, I just feel like the only way you would, you know, you would get it from that circumstance is if you like ended up kind of going outside the protocol setup, you know, yeah. um, or ignoring them. So if that doesn't bother me. You know, the idea of full uh, arenas, full stadiums excites me for when that day comes, you know, I think that, uh, you know, once, the vaccine has been widely available to, uh, you know, everybody. Um, and we see, you know, community transmission plummet, you know, at that point, hopefully we can get to that place because then it's sort of like a personal choice, right. Um, where it's like, you've had the chance to get vaccinated. Um, you know, you, it's really low. And, uh, if you don't feel comfortable going to a game, you don't have to, you know, like, but if you're someone who does, now you have that option. Um, so I hope that day, you know, hopefully things get better and better and uh, and that day comes soon. I, I think for me, Jimmy calling games, I think as soon as I'm fully vaccinated, I probably, you know, two weeks after dose number two or two weeks after Johnson Johnson, whichever I, I, I you know, ended up getting, I, um, I think I would feel fine. Yeah. I, I, I do. I think I would feel comfortable at that point. Um, until then, if it was full, like if you told me I got to go to Barclays tomorrow, it's going to be, 18,000 people, I would, I would feel skittish. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's, it's the, the vaccine is interesting. Um, in talking to friends and everyone's mentality, like I've gotten one shot so far mm-hmm. and like, I'm ready to go. Like I want to yeah. go on a restaurant right now. I want to go get my hot towel shave. I want to go to the dentist, which I haven't been to. like, I'm ready to go, but like you, you know, it wouldn't be smart. So close to the end here. Like you got to wait for that second shot and then wait a week or two. But, you know, and then I know I have, I had someone yesterday tell me even after their second shot, they're not going to go in a restaurant for a while. So everyone is so different, you know, mentally about this. Yeah. And, and that's to me, like, then that's their, you know, that's their personal choice. Right. Like, I think that, you know, in the beginning, what we have to remember is a lot of these measures were implemented because there was a serious risk to our health system just collapsing, right? Right. Our healthcare system collapsing. But when that is no longer a risk, then you need to think about, you know, what is just going to be a a personal choice of comfort, you know, like, you know, at, you know, when we hit, and, and also I think it's interesting from the business's perspectives too, right? Because for certain businesses, there might be more of a, they might get more people in there if they're not a hundred percent than if they are, because if they're a hundred percent, you know, maybe the vast majority of their patrons all of a sudden don't feel comfortable. You know, it's a very, it's difficult. I, I, I feel for everybody trying to navigate this. I, yeah. I was talking to a couple of people in the restaurant business the other day, and they were just saying, you know, the joy has been sucked out of the experience because, you know, every day they're on a call if they feel like a COVID director, you know, trying to figure this out and how they can do it. But, but I do think like, I'm someone who's, I, 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 I'm very well read on this over the last, uh, you know, this is basically, I spent my, when I wasn't doing games, four months reading four hours a day of scientific preprints and following all different kinds of, you know, people in, in, uh, in science and, in you know, molecular biology, all this stuff. And, and I do think like the vaccines are amazing. Like Mm. they are amazing. And I think as we see more and more real world data of them working come out, um, like what we're seeing in Israel and we're seeing in the UK and we're starting to see here, especially in nursing homes. And you see like, oh, wow, this has like potent effect. I think then people will feel more and more comfortable doing things and hopefully things will open up more and more because I think it'll be safe to do so, you know, without being an expert in this at all. That just seems like to be what the informed trending would be barring any other, you know, weird uh, circumstances. Did you ever get used to calling the games from your house or is that always, every time you did it, a weird and bizarre experience? It's, it's, it's not hard for me to like become immersed, you know, in the action because like 
you have a big screen, it's right in front of you, um, you care and you take pride in your work. And so it's not hard for me to feel invested. Um, and I don't think it's hard for me to sound invested or have the proper energy. Um, but uh, what, what is um, always a little difficult, honestly, is just there are certain nuanced things that you can only get by being there, you know? And even like when we do a broadcast from home, the internet is like, because the feed's coming through the internet, it's like a, it's a slight delay and the picture can be a little bit lagging frame to frame. So like on a fast break, it might kind of just like stutter, you know, and like it's right. hard to identify specific things. So you have to adjust your call a little bit instead of like Lillard tries to bounce a pass to the left wing, you know, whatever. It's like a Lillard, uh, you, you know, hmm. a Lillard has the pass deflected instead of being able to name who deflected it, you know, or like instead of being able to identify who's on a three on one, you may just be like fast break here for Portland. I don't know why I'm going heavy Portland on this analogy, but <laughs> you, you understand. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, and so that's a little difficult. And then there are things like, you know, the officials going over the table, you know, like, and you know what's going on, right, right. When, but when you're on site, but you don't hear or like something with the shot clock or seeing a reaction on a bench, you know, so, and the other thing is just as a play-by-play -play guy, and I know any other play-by-play -play person listening to this would, would feel this way. Like when you hear your calls back on those games and, and you know, your call is just like a split second delayed. So you see it go through the hoop and then you hear the punctuation, you know, and it's just like, you, it's hard to ever feel like great about those calls, you know, but I will say this, our technology and operations people have done an unbelievable job to make the broadcasts reputable, credible, um, you know, hitting the standard necessary to have the product on the air while dealing with these incredible constraints and keeping us uh, safe and healthy. Uh, before I let you go, let's, let's talk about something um, happy. I'm like... <laughs> Corona. Um, your pod with CC Sabathia. I, now, most podcasts, except for, you know, sort of the top of the top, really suffered through the pandemic because people weren't commuting. They weren't going to gyms, you know, so they took a hit. But yours, the R2C2 pod with CC, uh, really rolling along. And I saw Esquire named you guys one of the best podcasts. And you're with Spotify now, which has to be um, huge. So if you want to talk about the pod for a sec, give people a little taste of what it is, they can check it out after listening to this one. Thank you, man. I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, yeah, I mean, we've been nomadic. So I think in some ways we've made it difficult on our listeners because we started a Players' Tribune. We built an audience. Then we went to Uninterrupted. We built a way bigger audience. And then we went to Spotify and The Ringer. And, you know, we're, we're building a new audience there as well as, um, you know, taking along our other listeners, but they've had to go to three RSS feeds. So I feel for them <laughs> and I appreciate all of yeah. you for so following along. Um, and so uh, we, uh, Spotify and The Ringer has been great. Um, and, uh, and the thing with our podcast is that I think makes it very unique is CC is one of the most disarming people, you know, I've ever been around, you know, he's got this all world laugh. He's ridiculously smart. He's unbelievably accomplished. So he has the respect of everybody who comes in. And then he's just got this, this really, you know, incredible way about making people feel like they can, you know, share things. And so I, I, I Jimmy, almost universally, every single guest who comes on our podcast when they get done they're like that was so fun like that was you know I, I so enjoyed that I'd love to do it again um and you know I think that because of that we get really interesting conversations and we get guys to say things that they don't feel like you know are comfortable in in other settings and then Cece and I have a very genuine friendship and uh respect for one another and so I feel like it's just a good time you know we're not trying to we're not doing gotcha radio you know right. we're not we're not trying to make mountains out of molehills we're just trying to shed light on personalities and storytelling and have fun with it and it seems to connect with people which is great and so uh so yeah so so hopefully we'll keep it going yeah and cc has a great personality for a podcast oh, so fantastic. perfect fit yeah well it's also like you know you have to be uniquely credentialed too and and comfortable with yourself to say what you really believe and right. not be worried about who you're going to piss off every time you say something, you know, yeah. and CC, 
you know, you, you have the career that CC had and, you know, and, and what he was able to accomplish and achieve. And then also what he's been through personally with, you know, going to rehab and everything and the way he found, you know, comfort in his own voice. And it's like, yeah, he couldn't be more authentic. And that is something that's excellent for a pod. All right. Well, I'm glad the pod's rolling along, but I want to see you do some Yankee games this year. Missed you last year with that limited schedule in the, in the fake baseball oh. season. Now we're going to have a real season here, it looks like. So we, we need you I, back on yes for those fill-in games. I appreciate that, man. I will be doing some regular season series this year, good. Uh, which is good. I, I love, obviously, doing it. I'm actually going to be doing tonight's game uh, oh. on yes uh, and Saturdays as well. Nice. Um, so if, if this is being released on Wednesday, then it's tonight's game. If it's being yeah. – it is okay. Yeah. So tonight, well, Wednesday, Saturday. Well, okay. Yes. Replay. Do they replay the preseason games? Cause I know they replay the hell out of the regular season. Yeah. Game, no, but. I think, I don't know. Yeah, we do. I think I'm not sure, yeah. but Wednesday, Saturday this week, I'm doing the games. Uh, nice. And I appreciate that, man. It's fun to be back. It, it, uh, it was tough not getting to do any games last year with the crazy circumstances. I missed it, especially yeah. after 2019. Um, but yeah, it's just going to be fun to, to be back in the mix and get to do some action and, and uh and fill in uh you know where where is needed so um yeah man it should be a fun season between the nets and the yankees yeah. yes a lot going on and we just launched our new app jimmy the yes app so you got to download that man can, can you, you watch it right on right on your phone oh really because i usually watch it i watch Yankee games on the fox app that's yeah, how so I now to. you're going to be able to watch it on the yes app nice okay yeah, yeah. we'll do that yeah. all right i appreciate it you, good you luck stay it. safe thanks i got one question for you sure jimmy, hit me before i go Go ahead, hit me. When, when are you going to have another? Uh, you got to have some with Jeter sometime soon. You always got the most out of him, man. You I know. Been it's been a long time, though. It's been a long time, and that you know, I don't know. I don't think. Uh, I don't think Derek Jeter has any reason whatsoever to have to talk to me. So. Yeah, but he he li- he clearly liked you. He he would always give you the most stuff. You know, it was a long time ago. It was like pre Twitter, and and um, you know, back then, like doing Q and A's with athletes was a bigger deal than it is now because they just have their, although, you know, Jeter, one of the few who have remained off Twitter, God bless him. Mm-hmm. Maybe the smartest guy in the world just for oh that. Oh my gosh, you ain't kidding. Um, you know, it'd be, I will say this, an, inter- an interview with him now, now that he's, you know, not playing. Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to see what his post, you know, I mean, now he's, you know, dad of two and I guess, you know, there was so much talk about the St. Jetersburg house, but I guess he's selling and then Brady. I mean, there's a lot there, but I don't see Jeter just, you know, being like, yeah, let me go on the SI Media podcast with Jimmy Trainer right now. I have nothing better to do. You know what? I I, I want you to keep, you know, knocking on that door because right. I love I love the Jimmy Jeter chemistry. So I'll, I'll see what more. I can do. I'll see what I can do. I appreciate <laughs> it. All, All right. Be well, man. You too. Thanks. Take care. All right. Joining me now. From CNN, something a little non-sports, but it all ties in with this week where we uh, look back at the one-year marking of corona sort of taking over the world. The host of Reliable Sources on CNN and the chief media correspondent for CNN, Brian Stelter, who does an excellent job. Brian, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you. My first time on. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I have to say, I, I became a big fan of yours when you were at the Times. I saw a documentary at Lincoln Center on the Times. And I think I have a terrible memory, so forgive me. I think that, I don't know if the doc was more about the Times or David Carr, um, but you were a big part of it. And obviously Carr was. And um, that's sort of when I, you know, and then obviously reading your media stuff in the Times. But that was, a. am mentioning it because if, I don't know if you know where people can seek it out, but that was an excellent doc if, if people want to. Check Thank you. Yeah. Uh, page one was about the New York Times in theory, but it was really about David Carr. That was the heart and soul of the film. I like to say I was one of his supporting actors. Yeah. And uh, and that was back when the Times was going through real, real fiscal turmoil. You know, now it's got its legs. And it was this week last year that the Times editor said to the newsroom, this is the biggest story since 9-11 telling the staff coronavirus is the biggest story since 9-11, got a lot of people's attention. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, I'm, I'm grateful that I was able to spend years at the New York Times and now be at CNN to know the print side and now know TV. It, it, it's hard to ever ask a question um, about quote unquote the media because it's such a broad, broad scope. <laughs> um, 
But putting aside just the fringe whacked out, you know, OAN and Newsmax stuff, but just the regular normal media. Um, what do you think they did well this past year covering COVID? And what do you think they did poorly this year covering COVID? It was this week last year when news outlets really shifted into a public service mode. Um, what are the facts? What do you need to know? How can you stay safe? You know, you saw the numbers of doctors on television exponentially grow. Uh, I think that networks and newspapers shifted into public service mode really well. Um, given that we didn't know a lot and given that some of the information we were getting last March was faulty or incomplete at best, I think networks uh, and newspapers and, and media outlets rose to that task. What was harder was keeping up with all the changes and the, the revised guidance and the, the revised information we had about uh, what you know it, about all sorts of things from from death rates to uh, to best precautions and protections for your family. This this story keeps changing. It keeps morphing. It's almost like a um, like a jello that's hard to hold on to. Sometimes you don't know what the very latest is with this pandemic. And I think um, that's that's just been a challenge. It's been a big challenge for newsrooms that are trying to get it right. And then to your point, there's also media outlets out there that are not trying to get it right. They're trying to get uh, outraging clicks and and, uh, and 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 engage in trolling. And those outlets certainly pushed faulty narratives that that harmed uh, the American response. But but I think that the the media's challenge has been to keep up with, you know. The, the, is there, are cases rising? Are they plateauing? What does that mean? Are they, you know, is it getting safer? Is it getting more dangerous? It's been really hard to help people understand that day to day and week to week. Yeah. Um, and obviously, um, March 11th, 2010, you know, if you're a sports fan listening- 2020. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm looking <laughs> at the clock and it said March 10th and that's what got me. I'm a, I know I host my own show. I can't help it. I can't help yeah. it. Uh, t- March 11, 2020. If you're a sports fan listening to this podcast, I think for every sports fan, it was the Rudy Gobert positive test. And that led to the NBA suspending the season. And then following that was Tom Hanks later that night revealing that he had COVID uh, for you. You're just, what was, what was your, when did you realize this was what it was and, and when did it all change for you? Was it that night as well? I remember that night crystal clearly uh, in the back of an Uber riding through Times Square. And uh, you think about Times Square, normally um, you want it to be a hustle and bustle. You know, you want it to be the crossroads of the world. And I remember going through Times Square and thinking it's eerily loud. Like this place should now be eerily quiet, right? People should be staying home. It, sh- mm. it's, it should be eerily quiet, but it's eerily loud. There are hundreds of people out hanging out, having a good time. Like nothing's going on in the world. And I think, you know, as with so many Americans, that was the first day that I started, you know, my, my back started getting up and the panic, the panic started to happen a little bit. Um, the, uh, I remember being on the air that night with Don Lemon and uh, talking about the NBA shutdown and saying, this is the day that for tens of millions of Americans, the pandemic became real right. because movies were postponed and, uh, and celebrities have the virus and the NBA has taken this action. And look, Adam Silver, I think, deserves a lot of credit and, and, and his staff for seeing this and knowing that, um, uh, that it was going to make a, a drastic, scary statement and still going ahead and doing it. I thought that recent interview he gave where he talked about sitting in the car outside his apartment, you know, trying to get this done, dealing with this, then walking inside and telling his wife what he had just done. You know, what a consequential decision mm. that he made. But, but you know, going back to that night um, on set with Don Lemon, there were five of us around the table and we were all sitting, you know, almost elbow to elbow. And it was one of the last times I was on air in one of those um, socially not distant uh, moments. <laughs> I look back at that video now and it, it looks crazy. Yeah. I'm curious, how soon after that did it change for you guys where you had to like social? Di- I mean, someone... Yeah. I assume CNN never shut down. There was always an anchor in studio or did they ever go nobody in studio? I'm sure they had someone in studio at all times. Yeah. For the most part, we remained in studios for anchored programs Mm -hmm. and everybody else worked from home, Uh, correspondents and producers. You know, I would do live shots from this bedroom. um, But when it was time to anchor my own program, I'd be in the studio. The exceptions to that, of course, are Chris Cuomo uh, and a number of other times where there were COVID scares or people had reasons to work from home. Uh, But, but, you know, it's, 
if you can be in a studio and you are hardwired into the control room and you are hardwired into CNN master control, that is the most reliable way um, to keep a network on the air. Mm -hmm. and, and that was certainly the goal. But uh, to your point, you know, I remember for me, I think about it in terms of weeks. So like March 1st was the last time I shook anybody's hand on TV and, and it felt a little weird even on March 1st, you know, and then on March 8th, we wondered, are we supposed to sit far away from each other? And then on March 15th, we did. And then on March 22nd, no more guests, nobody in the studio, me all alone. March 29th, no studio at all, just me in a closet. Um, we have these things and, and most networks have a version of this. At CNN, we call it a flash cam. Other networks call these different by different names, but they are these, you know, cl big closet sized studios, just you and a robotic camera. And that's where I've been working ever since last March. And, and for the most part, if you look on CNN, once in a while, you'll see folks on a, on a studio set. Mm. Uh, but not very, not very often. I actually think the sports uh, networks have have gone further in terms of getting folks back, you know, in studio. Yeah. There's a little bit less reason for news networks to do it. I think. And even the sport, you know, I, I think of uh, TNT inside the NBA with Ernie Johnson and Charles Barkley and Shaq. They have they have plexiglass now in between them on the set. Right. Right. Um, but it's amazing how little of that, you know, it took a while, right? Because we didn't know what to do at first. Right. We just didn't know. March 11th is that turning point. People forget that President Trump addressed the nation that night. And, and sadly, he kind of made things worse. He, he, he flubbed some words and he didn't, he didn't really convey the gravity of the situation. It, instead, it was actually President Hanks. It was Tom Hanks that I think underscored the gravity of the situation. Right. And remember, he was in Australia. I remember, he and his wife were in Australia. And it also gave you a sense of, oh, this is every everywhere now like this not only could tom hanks get sick he gets sick halfway around the world right i want to talk about hanks for a second because um i had a tweet about something yesterday that i'll, I'll bring up but before i wanted to just you know may I, I i think i'm just a very naive person but I, if you would have asked me on march 11th march 12th of last year if a pandemic would end up being so so political, I, I, I would have never thought that. It never crossed my mind on those days that this would end up being a political thing and it did not take long for it to become a political thing. Yeah. I mean, somehow, you know, people turning Dr. Fauci into an enemy, just one of the most absurd things I've ever seen. Did you, I mean, you, you cover politics more than, I mean, you cover media, but you're in the political weeds of it. Um, did you expect it to become so political in that first week or two? Well, I think it was clear even before March 11th that the president's um, incompetence or refusal to, to grapple with the reality was going to be a problem. And, and I say that because, I, you know, I, by March 7th, by 8, March 8th, he's telling he's he's obviously playing it down in public, uh, discouraging people from taking precautions. Um and, and that was clear. In fact, on March 10th, he said, uh, don't worry, it's going to go away. Don't worry. Basically, you know, telling people to calm down, calm down. And I, I understand the instinct to try to calm people down that are panicking. But uh, the way to do that is to respond competently, provide them accurate information, uh, to give them someone to trust and hold on to and rely upon. And that wasn't happening on March 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, et cetera. So I, I think from that point of view, it was, it was going to be political. But was mask wearing going to become this cultural battle? Was, um, you know, th th that I did not foresee. And that I wonder how it could have been avoided. Well, that's, you know, there's two things at play here. There's flat out dishonesty. And then there's a word that people in the media don't ever like to use, but I'll use it. And that's stupidity. <laughs> and, and for, you know, the spin that Fauci told us we don't need to wear masks. You know, I remember the first month of the pandemic going to the supermarket, wearing the gloves and not wearing the mask. And then oh, it, interesting. Yeah. And then it was, we need to wear the masks. And for people to spin that as like, Fauci lied, makes the blood in my skin curdle. He did not lie. He got new information, new data. There was right. science going on at the time. It was not a lie. It was a change in what they have learned about this thing that they knew nothing about. Yeah. And there's two types of people that believe he lied. And this is some conspiracy. Either you're dishonest or you're stupid, which is really <laughs> what it's about. And I, I wish the media would take that angle of it more, but they don't. Mm, 
that's interesting. Okay, that's fair. I mean, well, what, what you're describing is getting new information is a good thing, right? right? Checking your priors, revisiting your priors, changing your view is a, is a good thing, and that should be celebrated. Critical thinking skills are a positive, uh, and yet in this black and white us versus them with us or against us world, it sometimes is punished. And uh, yeah, you know, that is a, it's a very, very sad truth. Um, I don't know how the media, I don't know how journalists can call out stupid. Like, how do you call out stupidity? You say though, you're stupid right? if you, you think <laughs> this guy lied. If you think he lied, you're stupid. Yeah. It's that simple because he didn't lie. He got new information. There's a big difference. He, right. Like, what did get new what would be the motivation of Fauci yeah. for lying? Like what would be his motivation to say you don't need masks and then you need masks? He wanted people to die? No. I mean, it's, right. a you know, so either you're just disingenuous, which I think there's a lot of that. I think a lot of, I think there's a lot of people. Well, who, there are a lot of people that are trying to protect the president's hide early on, right? This is what Sean Hannity and the others were doing. I wrote about this in my book, Hoax. This was this attempt to just, you know, make, make Trump look good, make him feel good, make him, make him seem like he's on top of the situation. Yeah. And that required bashing Dr. Fauci because Fauci actually was leading the way. Yeah. And the other, the other part of this, this t- ties into the Tom Hanks thing. And I think you've done a really good job with this. I think a lot of the, the political media maybe was, was late to it. Uh, this is what, I, what I tweeted yesterday was, you know, a lot of people now this week, everyone's looking back on what they learned from a year ago, what, what yeah. a year ago this week was like. Yeah. And I'll never forget as long as I live. A year ago this week was when I learned that QAnon thought the Tom Hanks coronavirus was a hoax <laughs> and a cover because he got arrested for being a pedophile. And... There is a tie in here. Tell me if I'm wrong. I want your thoughts. There's a definite tie in here in COVID and QAnon in terms of the rise of it. And I don't know if it's because people were trapped in their houses for so long and had more time to go on the Internet and go ahead on social media and do conspiracy theories. But it doesn't seem like QAnon would have. I mean, listen, I knew about QAnon from Hillary with the Pizzagate. And I always thought in my head that was specific to Hillary. She's a polarizing Mm -hmm. figure. People Mm -hmm. don't like her. Got it. But now Tom Hanks is a pedophile. Like I'd never knew that QAnon went from, you know, let's go after Hillary, which could have been a politically motivated thing to Tom Hanks. And, you know, I know they think Ellen and Madonna and Oprah, they all are in some ring where they drink blood from kids. I think COVID helped the rise of QAnon. What do you think? Yeah, numerous researchers have showed have shown that people were, were in trance, were pulled into this cult-like phenomenon. And I do think it's because people were at home, they were online. Not only did they have lots of time to be on the internet, they had lots of time to search for simple answers to complex fears and threats. You know, COVID is a complex threat. Um, and when when those when you're faced with that, some people do want simple, safe solutions and and and, and answers or distractions. QAnon was both a, a explanation for the world and a distraction from the world. And uh, sadly, it did draw in new converts uh, once this all went down. You know, this is where the internet is the best and worst you know, the best friend and worst enemy of, of the public. You know, so many of us connected and FaceTimed and Skyped and were able to survive this together online. Uh, and then so many other people retreat into dark rabbit holes. Yeah. Where, where does QAnon stand now with, you know, Biden is president. Uh, there were all these dates where I guess they thought yeah. Trump was going to be reinstated. Like it's, you know, the WWE or something. <laughs> There's no reinstatement. Like Biden's still president. Where are they? I, I, have they lost people? Have people have, have I know I, I, you hear stories here and there about people who have, you know, jumped ship, but right. is it still stronger than ever? What, where, where do we stand? Well, with- that's an important point. It's very hard to measure this. It's very hard mm-hmm. to measure the scope of this. And it's even harder nowadays where there are not these so-called Q drops where the leader of this craziness is is dropping out new morsels and clues for the audience to, to, to devour. Now it's more of a, um, a decentralized, um, you know, unorganized sort of, um, I, I'm going to use the word free thinking, but in a, mo- in a sense that I'm mocking it. I'm a free thinker. I'm out there coming up with my own explanations for not what's going on. Yeah. Right. I'm not being a she, you know, these, these nonsensical kind of um, excuses for going out and believing uh, kooky and, and sick, really twisted, demented theories. Um, 
it has it, QAnon is increasingly just this fringe cult like um, you know uh, way of moving about the world disconnected from the original theories. Yeah. And and that you know that kind of morphine is dangerous and continues to lead to, to threats about domestic extremism, you know that and I think we you know there are straight lines from the beginning of the pandemic and the uncertainty and the stress that it put on people. I kind of feel maybe you feel this way too. Like I feel like it's changed me the pandemic in ways I won't know for a few years. I know some of the ways it's changed, but like yeah. there are other impacts to this thing that I'm not going to know for a long that we are not going to know about ourselves for a long time. Yeah, and I, I, I don't. I think people are going to learn. I don't know if it's going to be a long time before people learn because I think with the vaccines now, maybe when we snap back, yeah, that's yeah. what I think. I think there's right. people. I, I mentioned this. I think already on the. I did. A, I spoke to Ryan Rucco early, and I mentioned. You know, I have a friend of mine who told me that even when he's got both vaccines, he's still not ready to go into a restaurant. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, you know, is that going to last for a long time? I think. I think people need to na- uh, still need to navigate what post vaccine life is like. Right. And then we'll see like the final impact of COVID. Um, I had the first experience yesterday where I was I walked into a bookstore just to browse. Mm-hmm. And I, I've, I've had one of my doses. I'm about to have my second dose. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like I have some protection, but obviously not. And just to spend an hour in a bookstore was a, was an interesting feeling. Normally you go to the grocery store, you got your list, you run in, you run out, you go to target, you get in, you get out, you don't browse. At least mm-hmm. I haven't browsed in a store for a year. And so f- having, um, restoring some of those old feelings. Another example, uh, my wife just got her second dose. We went out, uh, we had pizza sitting outside at a restaurant for the first time in a year. We hadn't ever outdoor dined. This was just pizza, but still you, you start to feel like, um, you're, you're bringing back a part of yourself that you hadn't mm. felt in a year. And that is a, it is almost like an out of body experience in a strange way. Yeah. I've done the outdoor dining and I've, you know, a lot of people like, you know, and, you know, friends conversations, a lot of people always ask these days, like, what's the first thing you're going to do? Or what can't you wait to do? Go to a concert. <laughs> and I always say like, I just, I want to, I, I want to be in that, in a restaurant, a nice restaurant where there's buzz and there's atmosphere because even with the, the outdoor dining, it's nice on a nice day. Like in the summer, it's great. Cause you could just lounge and relax and, you know, eat a nice meal, but you know, it's not the same as like that restaurant on a Friday night, maybe a steakhouse, yeah, yeah. there's buzz, there's atmosphere, yeah. people are talking, you know, I, I miss that. I also think it's going to be interesting to see, mm. um, you know, the effects of it on people in different age groups. You know, um, I have nieces who are 15 and 11 and, They've handled it, I think, better than adults in a way. But that age mm. group, their whole lives is being on electronic devices. So, like, <laughs> quarantine is not the worst thing for people that age, you know. Right, so it's, right. it's everyone's different with it, I think, in terms of age right. groups. So, right, definitely. Um, there was something else I wanted to ask you about that night, and now it just slipped my mind. But well, the NBA really was the domino that every other league followed, right? Yeah. Because once the NBA did it, it was clear everybody was going to. And Scott Van Pelt said that in his uh, interview with Garrett Graff, it was a great Wired magazine reconstruct of March 11th. I think about March 12th, and I was on CNN saying every hour, like it, it, you know, in the last hour, John King, here are the 10 things that have been canceled. <laughs> I remember sitting with Brooke Baldwin in the afternoon saying, Broadway is shutting down all of Broadway. And at first she didn't, it, it was so unfathomable. She was like, yeah. what do you mean? What do you mean? Bro-? Like, I mean, all of Broadway is shutting down tonight. Yeah. And, and it was just every hour. And it was really, I think it was not, I want to say entirely because of the NBA, but that domino then caused the next day movies to be canceled, um, theaters to be closed, all these other, and then of course other leagues and March Madness, all of that kind of, like a snowball rolling down a hill on March 12th and March 13th. And for me, it was really Friday the 13th that it crystal, you looked around and you thought, okay, that we just seen five days of this. And we've gone from like this slow motion kind of slowdown to a hardcore shutdown. Yeah. It, it, it happened fast when the, the NBA was the first domino and then it really all happened so quickly. I remember what I wanted to ask you times in with your book hoax. Um, I said even before coronavirus was a thing or COVID was a thing, I've always said to to people when talking politics that forget policy. 
I think the most damage that Donald Trump has done, did, will do, is just a complete assault on the truth where people in this country don't believe things they see with their eyes and don't believe things what they hear, they hear with their ears. And mm. I don't know how we come back from that. And then COVID happened. And I think it made everything worse. I, you know, I don't want to be like so depressing and doom and gloom, but like, I don't, I don't, I don't see how we come back when so many people have been convinced that the truth isn't the truth. Now, this is something you cover. Is there any hope? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I feel like the world you cover, there's more hope because people can't deny what's on the scoreboard. Right. They can argue about why it happened and they can blame the refs, but they can't argue what's on the scoreboard. And in news, that's where we are now, where people are pretending the scoreboard is made up or, or, or they, they change the numbers of their own will. And, and so can we come back from that? Well, I think the, the good news is most people are not in denial about the reality around them. And uh, most people do wear masks when, I, when I'm out at the grocery store running around the aisles. And, and most people do uh, want this COVID relief bill to get through the Congress and get signed by the president. Like, like there, there are clear majorities for the side of truth and normalcy in government and decency in politics. Um, you know, we, we can say that the, the you know, that um, the, 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 there are still, you know, I, I, I think even, even a lot of Trump voters in polls acknowledged he wasn't telling the truth. Not all, not all, not all voters, but many Trump voters said in polls that he wasn't honest or trustworthy. I found that to be so interesting, right? They're obviously supporting him for other reasons, and then we can, that's a separate conversation. But um, that means people do see what it was and see what he was doing and understand his tactics. And I think in a weird way that gave me hope um, while, while, the, while, while, while Trump was in, in office. And um, now I think this great kind of. Uh, make America boring again, sort of agenda by Biden is also pretty well accepted by the public and embraced. So perhaps uh, most people want um, a lot more, you know, basic uh, meat and potatoes truthiness in their diet. I hope Maybe so. is that, am I, am I, am I, am I, am I you can tell I'm not I, fully persuaded myself. So I don't, I understand I'm not persuaded. Here, here's what I think. And don't get offended by this because I say this to all of my friends and family in my own life. <laughs> that I think you got a little bit of a New York bubble speaking there. Like, <laughs> you know, I will say this. I went, so I went into the city. I went into, I live in Long Island yeah. and I went into Manhattan last Thursday for the first time since this whole thing happened to get my shot at the Javits. And I was amazed that 99% of the people I saw, first of all, I will say this, this death, New York is dying thing. Midtown, you would have never known there was a pandemic. Midtown was like it always, well, like so I always We are coming it. back. It's true. We're coming. I waited in a line for two hours at Javits for my shot. Yeah. So I was amazed that 99% of the people walking around Manhattan on a beautiful day last Thursday um, were wearing masks. Stop. Yeah. We're wearing masks. Now here on Long Island, it's a little, we're not as congested. So if I, you know, I see a lot of, you know, when the weather gets nice, like the last couple of days, people are out going for walks, taking their kids, yeah, their yeah. dogs. They're not, not all of them are ma maybe half are wearing masks. We're in the city. Yeah. Everybody was wearing a mask. But then, you know, I talked to friends and family in Florida and they're like, oh yeah, there's like no coronavirus here. Everyone, every, restaurants are packed with people not wearing a mask. So I, th so mm. I do think where you right. live might um, affect sort of your outlook on all of that. But I think that's true. And I think that's true. And I think you have to recognize the, um, if you uh, are in a family dynamic, for example, where there are hardcore Trump supporters and there are serious Biden supporters, like those collisions have done such damage. And, and in, that, in those environments, this feeling that most people support truth and want to know what's really going on, doesn't feel, doesn't register, right? right? It rings right. hollow. Right. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I also think that that, is like, where you I said, worry. like you, like you just said that where the truth rings hollow and you said earlier about, um, you know, even the Trump, a lot of the Trump supporters knew he would lie and was, you know, but they excused it because again, policy now is irrelevant and it's about owning the libs. So who cares if Trump lies, if we own the libs, then it's worth the lie. Right. That's that he's lying on their behalf. He's lying on their behalf to make, right. uh, to, to advance their agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, th this is why the 2024, uh, you know, primary is going to be so important, right? 
um, because this issue is primarily on the right. You know, I'm sure, sure there's liberal lies out there, but this, this shamelessness about uh, assaulting the truth is happening largely on the right. And I think the battles within the party, the Adam Kinzinger's of the world to hold their colleagues, hold their, um, their fellow party members accountable is fascinating. Yeah. You need more of it. Um, Last thing on, on, on COVID, and I just want to ask you a couple of personal questions about just your career. Um, now we have the vaccine situation. And again, here in New York, it seems like everyone's ready to go get a vaccine. Um, in the sports world, there's a, I, I think it's not a big story yet. I, I wrote this in my column yesterday. I think it's going to become a big story where you had LeBron James say whether he gets it or not as a private family matter. Um, you know, some people think if he got it and he speaks out, that helps. Uh, media coverage of, of the vaccine. Do you think it's been, uh, do you think the media should be encouraging people to get the vaccine or is that not the role or job of media? Um, the media needs to help people know the, the facts about the vaccine. And because the facts are so rosy, uh, it certainly comes across as uh, this is something that is healthy and safe for you to do. And if that sounds like encouragement, that sounds like encouragement, but I think we've got to, you know, just leave with the facts, leave with the reality of, of what's going on with the vaccines. Um, that's why I try to be public about, you know, getting, getting, getting my shot. Like, you know, my wife had her second shot, didn't feel a thing afterwards, uh, all good. The, the more people who are just telling that truth and describing what it's like, the better. And, and where the press has, 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 um, has had shortcomings in this coverage is in getting so um, uh, talking about the data in such a way that actually downplays the efficacy of these, uh, these vaccines and makes them seem not as effective as they actually are. Mm -hmm. I think we have to look no further than Israel and the results from Israel where the uh, virtually the entire population has been vaccinated. That data is astonishingly uh, strong and uh, we need to focus. I, I think that the press needs to highlight those examples rather than, I mean, in some ways, we're talking so much about vaccine hesitancy before people have a chance to be hesitant, right? Let's, let's, let's solve the demand problem. Let's, right. let's see where we are in a month uh, and see how much hesitancy there really is or isn't. Uh, yeah, but we just need to arm people with the facts. Yeah. I mean, the, the vaccine rollout in the beginning, especially here was such a disaster. I remember when I took my dad for his first shot in early, in early January, he, you had to wait outside two hours in the 40 group and oh, it's so much better crazy. now and it's so much more yeah. organized and i wish there was more people understood like it's it's you know i went to javits i was in and out hour and 10 minutes it's it it's really well run now so if, if and, anyone's and i hesitant, said mine was a little longer but i was out on long island yesterday with my wife we did it at um at a, what's it called jones beach uh -huh. in and out in 20 minutes no yeah. line just to drive up it was like going to mcdonald's but it was jones actually beach, good for you don't you. get out of the car they give you the shot while you're in the car it was amazing yeah it was so yeah. good um cu a couple of things i'm just i'm curious about with with your career um because i go through this with sports illustrated because i cover and write about media a lot how difficult is it for you to cover media while working at CNN? I get that question a lot and I know where it comes from, but the, I've been relieved to experience uh, autonomy and experience, you know, none of the troubles that the people might imagine. Like, you know, for example, uh, I remember the day that, uh, uh, that we all learned that uh, Michael Cohen had been uh, making these deals with companies, working for companies, getting paid by companies like AT&T, which is CNN's parent company. Now you can imagine how sensitive that might be. You know, why, why is Trump's uh, fixer being paid by AT&T hundreds of thousands of dollars? And uh, the reaction from inside CNN was, cover this as aggressively as you would cover anything else with any other company. And then a year later, I'm on the phone with the CEO of AT&T and uh, he, he ribs me about it, which I thought was great because he's like, man, you were you all were really tough on us that day. And I said, that's exactly how it's supposed to work. And he agreed. He said, that's exactly how it's supposed to work. But I, I liked that, that that dynamic exists. And, you know, if you've got a grievance, you let us know but we're going to go and do our jobs and, and have autonomy. So, uh, you know, I've been um, in a way, you know, it hasn't come up. So the, the issue of covering CNN inside CNN really hasn't come up the way that I might've imagined it would when I joined many years ago. What about from the standpoint of just, you know, you see something on CNN that you would like to criticize 
um, you know, and again, it's one of those things where it's like, is it worth it? Is it not worth, you know, what's the end game here? But, yeah. you know, I have a view about that, about cable news more broadly. When mm-hmm. I see a fleeting, foolish moment on MSNBC, even or Fox, I would say fleeting moments that go viral on cable news are, are actually not the real um substantive worthy of critique thing about cable news. On the other hand, when Fox News talks about Dr. Seuss more than the COVID relief bill, that is something worth talking about and analyzing because it's not just a fleeting 30 second minute of foolishness. It is a choice and it's an editorial decision to make. And that's where I think we should hone our energy, not on, you know, the viral stupidity that sometimes happens on TV. Um, That's just my personal view. But also I've also tried to stake my, tried to make a distinction between being a media critic and a correspondent. And, and certainly sometimes I do share my, my point of view, but I think, I think the, the best value I can add is as a correspondent, a reporter gathering information uh, and, and then, you know, book a bunch of critics and talk about it. Uh, I think that distinction is important uh, to, to make because I think there's a lot of untold stories in media mm-hmm. that are just waiting to be told, whether it's in sports media or it's in pol- politics. Yeah. You know, I did a story last week about David Muir and George Stephanopoulos at ABC, this battle over a title, this battle over who anchors special reports. And that story was just like hiding in plain sight until I found it. Uh, and so that's what I want to try to do more of, especially in the post-Trump era, where it feels like we're not at a 10 out of 10 all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of talk <clears throat> about what happens with CNN and I guess MSNBC as well in the post-Trump era. Um, but it doesn't seem like, I mean, listen, you don't have his you know, daily tweets to decipher every day, but outside of that, it doesn't seem like much is dying down in terms of like, it still seems like it's right versus left and liberal versus conservative. And that's all still going. So all of the the fault lines are still there. All of the scabs that he ripped off America are still uh, there uh, out in the open air. Uh, You know, and of course a lot of what Biden's doing is reversing or reacting to Trump. So there's a ton of news to cover. The difference I found uh, with, with Trump versus the Biden years is, Sometimes the lead of my show is a little less obvious. Uh, it takes, or to put it a different way, sometimes I feel like I have five different options for what I could lead with versus when the president calls you the enemy of the people, that's a lead story, right? right? For a media show, like right. it, with, with Trump, I almost always knew the lead. And, and nowadays I, I'm actually appreciating the- I was gonna say, um, well, don't you like creativity. that more? Yeah, don't you like yeah. that more? I, I think I do. Let's check yeah. with me in three more months. Uh, it, it's it's an interesting challenge. Okay, what what of these five stories is the best thing to lead with yeah. uh, to make a statement about? But it is uh, it is definitely a change from the days when you know um, Trump is threatening libel lawsuits. Like that would be a lead story for me, given my beat. And now there's a lot more um, uh, blue sky to play with. Well, speaking of news and media, it just came in my head while you said that about covering the news stories. Do you think Piers Morgan quit or was fired? <laughs> oh, Piers Morgan. Mm. I, um, I'll take him at his word so far, which is that, you know, he trusted his gut and wanted to stand by his honest belief, which is that Meghan Markle's full of it and, and wanted the right to say that. Uh, it sounds like maybe this is a situation where they wanted him to say sorry or take it back. And he refused to do that because it wouldn't be the honest thing to do. So he's staking this position as the truth to like, I'm going to, I'm going to tell the, tell my truth, no matter what it costs me. That's the lane he seems to be taking. Um, to me, there's clear business calculations to doing that. And, uh, I think it's fair to be a little cynical about that. Um, but hey, I'll, I'll say this: he was imp- he was helping improve the ratings, so I'm not sure, sir. ITV just wanted to, to dump him overboard. Right. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, it, it makes sense to me that he jumped more than he was pushed. I guess is what I'm trying to say. What I, what I find really interesting about that story, just as someone who covers media, and I need to read more into it because I'm very curious about how it works. Maybe you can, maybe you have knowledge that you can share with me and the listeners is. You know, one of the big things about the story was that the station ITV got 41,000 complaints. And I guess 
they're way more strict over there than here about what you can say on TV. And, you know, I'm sure you can get 41,000 complaints about someone on CNN or someone on Fox news um, on any given day. And we do nothing about it here. Is it just that the TV FCC, whatever it is over there, they just have very strict rules about what you can say or not and not say on television. Well, it's, it's I, I would say it's not about rules about what you can say, but there are um, there is a, a regulatory base that uh, allows for customers, consumers, um, you know, viewers to register complaints, and those complaints must be read and addressed. And this is called Ofcom. It's the, it's um, right. Uh, it, it's something that actually is funded. It's it, it's independent of the UK government uh, because it's financed by the broadcasters. Okay. And uh, anyone can complain to Ofcom, register a complaint, and every complaint will be read and will be addressed. Uh, and so in the case of 41,000 complaints, which is an off the charts number, you know, Ofcom opens an investigation into, uh, into the complaints. Now, the language they would use is they're going to investigate the complaints. Well, we'll see how long that takes and what they would do as a result. But, you know, they do have this ability to uh, hold networks accountable for accuracy and impartiality. Those right, are the so key this words, isn't like just about accuracy. Like, so this isn't just if, like someone goes on TV and says the F word. This is That's right, about, which, we, okay. which in the U.S., right, the FCC does take action against broadcast networks for fleeting expletives, not for cable, right. but for broadcast. This is much more about, uh, you know, if, if someone comes on and is anti Meghan Markle, is anybody expressing the pro Meghan Markle view? Is there impartiality overall in the coverage? Now, I'm not an expert on this. It's actually very interesting to read about, though. People just yeah. Google Ofcom. You can read all about it. You know, networks, uh, you know, in, in the U.K., uh, do do have to pay close attention to whether they're meeting the the language set out for accuracy and impartiality. Yeah, uh, yeah, I want to definitely read more about that. I, I do. Find I think the phrase is "do accuracy." Like, there's there are you know, look, mistakes happen, right? right. And 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 screw ups happen. But it's a it, there there is at least a a forum for viewers to register complaints. It, which is very different than the U.S., where you know, right? You might tweet at me if I screw something up, but there, there may or may not be follow up, right? right? I try to try to reply to people, but you know, I might miss it. This actually enshrines a system for accountability, yeah. and a lot of folks in the U.S. look at that and say that that seems terrible. Others look at that and say maybe that's a model that we need here. I don't know. Yeah, um, you know, we've talked so much about the divisiveness, and and obviously the the cable news wars are pretty heated. <laughs> um, you get it pretty good from that side. Um, has it ever gotten too far? Have you ever had a scary incident where, you know, the other side there or have incited people to give you a little scare or is it hasn't gotten that bad yet? Uh, it's hard to know for sure. And, and here's an example. I remember a couple of years ago, a guy called into C-SPAN and threatened to kill me and threatened to kill Don Lemon. And this happened live on TV. So I guess he wasn't afraid of getting caught. And it just so happened that Sean Hannity had made fun of me the night before and had said this kind of some he, Hannity's narrative, which was bull, uh, closely matched up with what this caller said. But how do I know for sure? Right. How do I know for sure that uh, that, that guy was a Hannity fan? Right. Um, and, and I'm not looking to blame anybody in those in those cases either. Uh, I, I know that Hannity gets death threats and, and that's despicable. Uh, but we do have to think about what the impact, what the, what the end impact is of all this uh, charged rhetoric on, on television and across the web. Um, I am at the point now where I try to tune out uh, the, the haters. I hate that. I shouldn't use the word haters. Oh, geez. Like I try to tune I out. I would just say assholes at this point, because that's <laughs> really what it is, but you could say, haters. what I, I mean, listen, con I, I, I love the constructive criticism, right? right? I even love when people tell me my tie is not tied yeah. straight, but the, um, the name calling and the mockery is just, it doesn't help anybody. And, and, you know, it, it goes to the question that I asked Hannity when I saw him at a bar back in 2019 before, before COVID, I remember, um, you know, cause he calls me Humpty Dumpty and all these ridiculous names. And I said to him, like, don't, don't you ever like feel, don't you ever feel guilty? Like, what about your kids? Right? Like, I'm what the kind of example clears. are you setting for your kids? And of course he ignored the question, but yeah. I don't, I don't want my daughter to grow up and think that that's okay. Um, and I hope she doesn't. Well, can I get more information on this meeting with Sean? Ha so, so you were in a New York City <laughs> bar. And we just were at the Lambs Club on on, on forty fourth or forty sixth, and uh, no, it was a mediate party. So oh, okay. Mediate okay. invites all these people once okay. a year, and uh, now, you know it's it's, it's a super 
it's a, is it's he a great nice party. and cordial to you or is he calling you Humpty Dumpty? Uh, I believe it was like Stelter or something, or something to that effect. Or maybe actually, no, I wrote about it in Hoax. I think he said Humpty. I think he said Humpty and put his hands on my uh, on my shoulders. Oh, there um, you go. It was that mix of like oh, happy to see you, but also like kind of startled to see you, if that's possible. If right. you can have both those films at the same time. Look, he worked that room like a pro, going you know, hamming it up with George Conway. He didn't want to leave this party. Like, here's the guy that rails against the media elite every night, and right. he didn't want to be anywhere else in the world. That's right. that's all I needed to see about Sean Hannity. Yeah. But um, I did ask him for an interview again, because that's, look, fundamentally, no matter how many times Tucker Carlson makes fun of me, I view this as my job is to report on to to cover to analyze what you know why is it that tucker is such a big star what what, what do his viewers like about the show what what connects about the show that's more important than me coming up with a clever response mm-hmm. tucker's insults mm-hmm. at least i think it's more important yeah i i think this is something you know i've, I've followed you on twitter for a long time i think this and i may have sent you a tweet about this maybe once or twice years ago maybe in the beginning of the trump regime but i think where the one thing i think where you and i definitely disagree is Mm. like i don't see the point in interviewing a tucker carlson or shannon because they're (laughs) nothing they say will be in reality or truth so at the end none of of it none of it i just I think Tucker Carlson is out there making a persuasive argument on behalf of the middle class. I just think he also does it in ways that are inappropriate and, and sometimes downright, downright racist, racist. But there's, you don't think there's any truth at all to what they, like to the, maybe the they're, pitch you know, they're making. With them? Maybe they're, <laughs> I'm thinking of like the times where like, you know, when like CNN would put on Kellyanne Conway, like that I, I was vehemently against because that is nothing but lies. Whereas oh, maybe no, it's not. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Kellyanne Conway has she would she would tell you today was not Wednesday. I mean, it's Con- well, I, I mean, had I had Conway on three times. And what I'll say is every time I felt like they were diminishing returns, it was getting less valuable to the viewer. Yeah, well, to the point exactly. where we didn't we didn't ask her back anymore. But I mean, she I, started I guess, off with with what was it? Alternative, um, alternative, facts, fa- alternative Why would you facts interview someone like that? The Trump yeah, presidency. I don't get but it. But I think to watch how she deflects was newsworthy for a while. I, I respect you disagree, but yeah. I, I, no, I can for, get the, I while. get Tucker and Hannity because they host cable news programs and there is something there about what they would do on the show, not do interviewing techniques, this, that, you know, you know I mean, I can see that more than like the Kellyanne Conway's and the, and the Kaylee McEnany's who have never once told one truthful statement. So I can give you the Tucker and Hannity if you'd interview them. I, I that I wouldn't probably <laughs> complain about. Well, um, I tried, and they didn't want to talk to me for my book. Yeah. Go, go, go! Figure. Good news is everybody else at Fox wanted to talk. So do you get like all like do do you get all the Fox News viewers tweeting you like what those guys are saying and and you know some nights, but I'll tell you what's weirder. What's weirder are the nights when I know that Tucker has three million viewers and he insults me. And I only get one or two messages. And, and I, I, I got to tell you, that actually kind of worries me a little bit. And it worries me because it feels like we are divided so um, completely in this country yeah. into, these, into these echo bubbles that are so split that, that his fans didn't even, like nobody even told me about the attack, right? Like that's, a, that's actually to me weirder than to be trolled hundreds of times by right. his supporters. Right, right, like right. It's, it's almost worse for, it's almost worse to be attacked and not even know it happened. Right. I, I, <laughs> Which, I agree. It's like I fucked agree. up logic. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, since we're talking about this, I'll end it on this very, very important question. Are you a blocker or a muter? <laughs> I went through a phase where I blocked a lot of accounts, a couple thousand accounts. Uh, and now actually neither. Now I just um, turn on the quality filter. I barely hear the noise. Uh, and uh, when I do, um, you know, I just keep scrolling. I guess I'm a scroller. Maybe that's what I am now. I'm a, a scroller. scroller. Interesting. I mean, so many people are big proponents of the mute. I, now- I, do, I do say there are a few media figures I have muted and I've forgotten I muted them. Like I, you know, you forget they exist. Right, right. And it, it has helped me sleep at night. 
Yeah, I'm sure. But I'll never, but I'll never reveal who I muted. So no, I'm that's, sorry. I mean, that's the beauty of the mute. <laughs> I mean, that there have been one or two times where, you know, I've come across the feed of someone who I've muted and I see all these tweets to me and I, you know, for like a year and I haven't seen them. It's phenomenal. It is. Refreshing. And if I would have read them in real time, I would have gotten pissed. But when I read them a year later, it's funny. So it's, it's just funny. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's just funny. Yeah. And that's the way to view. You have mastered social media. You have to take it in stride. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, you really do need to back off. You know, what we do for a living, we have to be, you know, I tell people, I have to be on it. I can't not be on it. But like on the weekends, I, I'm barely on it. Like, yeah, you've got, you've got to step back as much as you can when you have the opportunities because you don't have the opportunities that much because we got to cover the stuff that's <laughs> on there. So, and Twitter itself is an interesting, do, do you get into covering the social media stuff? Because, you know, like, Twitter's going to under, there's all these changes now with like clubhouses right. coming and Twitter spaces. And now yeah. they announced right before we started, there's now they're going to have a Twitter tip jar where you can tip people for their tweets. Do you, yeah. do you like covering that stuff? I mean, you. I, I like to dip my toes into it. I like to include it in my newsletter at night, the reliable sources newsletter. Yeah. I think it's important to see the connections between what the social giants are doing and what media companies are doing, right? Who's reacting to who, who's influencing what? I think those connections are important. Yeah. Um, but I also think fundamentally these social tools are not built by journalists and they're not really built for journalists. The news industry uses of social are um, largely just, you know, built on top of something that is not built for us. Uh, right. And look, if, if, if Twitter was built for journalists, there'd be an edit button. Uh, there'd be a way to edit my tweets. So right. I think it's important to know the tools, but, uh, but I also, um, I want to, I want to view that they are anti-social as much as they are social, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good, very good way of putting it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it and keep up. Thank the you. Great work. Reliable sources Sunday mornings. Hoax in paperback on June 1st, I believe. You got it. That's right. And uh, obviously Brian on CNN covering uh, media. So thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> All right. My thanks to Ryan Rucco of ESPN and the Yes Network and Brian Stalter of CNN for the conversations. One year since uh, Corona shut it all down. We are coming back. Get your vaccines. Keep the masks on for a little longer. Keep the social distancing going. And I think the summer will be good for us. So uh, I was, uh, you know, not the best topic to reminisce about, but it's important. I think I think it's interesting to see where you are a year later after uh, what we've been through. Uh, before I say goodbye fully, let me just tell you that if you missed last week's SI Media Podcast, we have Mike Florio from Pro Football Talk. Two weeks ago, great episode with Brian Curtis of The Ringer and Alan Sepinwall, chief TV critic for Rolling Stone. Three weeks ago, Darren Rovell on the insanity that's going on with trading cards. So check any of those pods out if you missed them. And please subscribe to the Sports Illustrated media podcast. All right. Thanks for listening. Be well, stay safe. We'll see you next week. Take care.